I see people with $2 million that are spending it all on their kids. And I'm like, well, I know, you know, from people I know, and I'm like, well, you know, you've got to retire someday. You can, you can. But they do, and again, they do the child a disservice. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder, Adam Taggart. Thanks for joining us for part two of our interview with high net worth financial advisor, Ted Oakley. If you haven't yet watched part one of this discussion with Ted in which he explains why he doesn't think the bear market is over yet and is headed lower, likely much lower over the rest of the year, head over to our channel at youtube.com slash Wealthion and watch it there first. It sets the context for the investment themes we discuss in this video. Ted also shares the strategies he recommends for families to follow to successfully protect their wealth through the rough ride he sees ahead. So be sure to stick around for that. Okay, let's get started watching part two of our interview with Ted Oakley. I want to pivot to what I hope will be the second, the focus of the second half of this conversation, Ted. I've been really excited to be able to talk about this with you. Uh, is you work with high net worth families, that's your focus. And um, you have a really good sort of front row seat to uh, how these people have become very successful wealth creators in their lives, and then how they have passed that uh, on to pass those values on to their children, so that their children take that wealth and grow it for the family and the progeny for hopefully generations going forward, as opposed to just spending it all out. So if, if you could just kind of tell us uh, what have you seen as being some of the, the most important things to keep in mind for families who are working to build wealth to be able to have that sustain for the generations ahead? Let me say this. I, you know, I've looked at uh, major wealth for four decades or more. And interesting enough, a lot of that hasn't changed after they made a lot of money. One of the things that's happened that's different, though, the last seven or eight years is a lot of these families got paid so much for these companies that it was so much higher than it would have normally been. So there's a lot of money was created for families. And I have to say, uh, I don't have all the answers, but I have a, a lot of experience in w watching. And you we always break those down into two categories. You have the, the category of the business owning family that sold a company and made a lot of money, you know, let's say 25 to 250 million or higher. Then you have a whole group of people that I put in the second category that the prior generation was the one that had the money. So you're in the second, third, and fourth generation, and they've got an entirely different set of problems. But the first one where they make the money in this generation, and this is what I see with, with people and their children. And that is they want, if you ask them what they want, they would say, I want my children to be you know, good stewards of money. I want to be responsible in the community. I want to be feeling, they want all these things for them. And then the way they go about it is just give them a lot, some of them do, just give them a lot of money. Well, it doesn't work that way. One of the things you have to do and realize if you have a lot of money and you've got to really press this because it's hard, hard very hard for you to do as a first generation wealth. You probably, when you made a lot of money in that company, grew up without a lot, probably had some tough times, you had to pay the bill, sometimes you had to get payroll, whatever. And you instinctively don't want that to happen to your children, which is the reverse of what you ought to be doing. You need to be able, why do you, why do you think eagles kick the babies to the curb? I mean, it, there's a reason for it, okay? And that is you want them, in order for you to get what you want for that child, you're gonna have to do some things that are contra to your feelings. And that is, you're going to have to say, okay, look, you're going to have to go out and get a job. Not only, you know, you're not going to be traveling around backpacking Europe every summer. You're going to get a job. Okay. And when you get out of college, you're going to get a job. I'm not going to help you. Okay. I'll, I'll do the college. Okay. But you got to get a job. And the money part of it is not yet. It's too early. And I don't agree with these people, by the way, they bring these um, 16 and 18 year old kids in to the money manager and say, this is what it's all about. Because that's really not what it's all about. What it's all about is teaching that child 
some self-esteem that I can do it. I can do it on my own. I didn't need my mom and dad. Okay. I did it on my own. And then later on, when they're older, when you do put the wealth to them, they really appreciate it then because they understand now what happened. But I also see this whole set of people that they think, well, I'll just make it easy for them and make, you're not making it easy for them. Those kids that you give all that money to will spend the rest of their life trying to show you and the whole community that they're smart too, that they can make money too. But you know what they do? They make tons of errors because they didn't go about it the right way. And they, they're just trying so hard to be purposeful. They're trying to really say, okay, I can, I can do it. I'm going to show my parents I can do it too. When they make tons of errors. That's what I see out there. And I think people need to realize that you have to impart a different set of things for kids. If you really want them to be what you want. Okay. And it's hard to do by the way, but I've done it myself, but it's not, I learned a lot from a lot of other people, by the way, and it wasn't something I dreamed up, but and then you've got to, again, you've got a whole different set of problems for the second through the fourth generation. Um, they're in a different mode, but they, 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 they also have problems. And unfortunately they, they chase a lot of rainbows. Uh, because they haven't had the experience of actually, you know, building a business and knowing what's happening. They got the money. Don't get me wrong. Um, but I call it the um, cocktail party information. You know, they start exchanging information about my manager did this, and I've got one in Connecticut. I think I'll go to him. Well, I'm one in LA. I'll go out there. Well, you know, you got to know more than that. And so that's that's the way these things happen. Hopefully, that's not too long an answer for you, but that's the way I see it. No, it's it's a great answer, and it, it it jumps into exactly where I wanted to go here, which is, um, look, you work with generally with your firm. Your specialty is is high net worth individuals, like you said, um, you know, oftentimes clients that ran a business for many years, sold it, and are now wrestling with the decision of, okay, kind of my my daily purpose in life, you know, just went away. I just sold it to somebody, and I'm sitting on all this money, uh, a what do I do with my life going forward? But also how do I pass that money along after I'm gone that it continues to benefit my family for generations as opposed to just getting spent by my kids, right? And uh, you and I have talked a lot about this in the in the past that it, it seems like without good guidance, the kids generally spend it, not necessarily because they're, they're, they're wasteful, um, but they just haven't developed the musculature that made the initial first generation wealth builder successful at what they were doing. Um, so anyways, I, I think this is so fascinating to talk about because I think the principles apply to any family, really, no matter what your net worth is, right? If you, if you want your children to be financially savvy, to have a chance of, of, of making their own wealth, but, but also to the extent you have wealth to transition to them, to be good stewards of that and, and keep that going forward. I think the tenants are still largely the same. And, you know, what you talked about right there at the beginning of your answer, Ted, of, of, uh, the eagle kicking, you know, it's young out of the nest, so they learn how to fly. Um, it, it's, it is this struggle, you know. That, that we, I, I, I interviewed the um, uh, Bill Danko, who was one of the co-authors of the book *The Millionaire Next Door*, right, which was yeah. basically a scientific study of self-made millionaires to find out, you know, what what made them uh, successful. And uh, and what that study found too is that most millionaire wealth, self-made wealth, is lost by the end of the second generation. And, and it's because the entrepreneurs protected their children from the adversity and the struggle that the initial entrepreneur had to go through. They just thought, oh, it was a tough life. I don't want my kids to have to claw like I did. But it's that clawing through adversity that actually is what makes you a successful steward of money because you realize what it takes to earn it. You, you, you really you, you realize, okay, there's, there's actually principles and tenets uh, and a lot of hard work that goes into this. Um, uh, but like you said, you know, they, they, they learn the rules of the road. They don't get diverted by the siren song of the guy at the country club who's got a hot tip, right? Um, so it, it's a hard thing for a parent to set your kids up, to push them into adversity and to watch from the sidelines as they struggle through it. But if you kind of look at it from a, Hey, if I'm doing this out of love because I want you to actually be able to stand on your own two feet and to be your own, you know, wealth creator and and wealth uh, steward, 
um, it may be one of the most loving things you could do for them. Well, it is the most loving thing you can do for them because what happens is, it, this is really hard for somebody to do. I know if you're sitting there with 75, $100 million, you know, hey, I can take care of these kids if I want to, okay? However, you have to stop and think about it and say, okay, what is my window here to make, to have them be what they need to be as a person? Forget about me. I'm thinking about them. And the window is this. And, and I've seen some really wealthy people do this very, very well. They know exactly what they were doing. They didn't let the wealth show up or come through until later on. Yeah, they had a, you know, they had a big, they had, they had houses and different things like that. But when it came to the child, they said, hey, look, okay, you're going to work and I'm going to make sure that you have a job when you're younger, before you get out of high school, when you're in college, summertime, we're going to work. Okay. And, and you're going to have to make some money because you're going to help me, help me out through school. And then when they get out, they need a job. And what you do is that period, what they learn that first five or six years, seven years working for somebody else is they learn what the world's all about. And then, you know what? Um, I don't, at the end of that, their self-esteem is really high. And I've seen some great second generation people because they were taught well by the first generation. And then the flip side of that is I've seen just as many that were horrible because they were just given a bundle of money. And so they have no self-esteem. They have, they have no purpose in life. And they're continually, I see this all the time, continually trying to show that parent or those parents and everybody else in the world that, you know what? I'm just as smart as they were. I can do it if they can. And that's not the game. You know? I mean, the, the idea is for you to be out on your own and then, you know, show me what you can do. You know, Ryan Holiday has a great book out here in Austin called um, Ob The Obstacle is the Way. Neil uh, and uh, Nick Saban, I think, has used it with his, with his football team. But the, the, the part, the, the reasoning in the book is, look, if it was easy, you wouldn't do well. You wouldn't, it wouldn't be good for you. And so... I think that's true. The obstacle is the way. And it's the way that you have to learn things in life. And when you get to that end, if you, it's so good. I see the, I mean, I see these second generation that have really got it together because their parents did it correctly. You know, they didn't show them anything till they got to be 40 years old or something. But by that time, this group had already done their own deal. And so um, that's how you do that. And that's how you create it. But it's really hard for people with a lot of money. Hard well, it, 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 it is. And, and I would, again, say it, it's, it's hard for people, even of more modest means, to, to still not want to step in and, and, you know, provide bridges for their children over life's, you know, trials and tribulations. Um, and so uh, I, I think that the role of, of the folks watching this video and most of the folks watching this, you know, are parents or, or uh, have children that they influence, whether it's niece, nephews, neighbors, whatever. Uh, and it's really part of our role as, as, you know, people who are developing financial resilience to bring up the next generation, right? So, you know, wealth, we talk about the, the, the power, uh, the magic of compounding of wealth over time. Um, well, to take advantage of that, you got to keep the wealth in place, right? To, 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 for it to be able to benefit from the compounding. So uh, a lot of what we're sort of talking about here, Ted, you, you have in your book here, the psychology of staying rich. Um, and, and you've published a number of books like this where it's it's not a terribly long book, but it just contains sort of the essential information that you have have uh, gleaned from your time. Again, you know, your decades of advising people, many of them of, of, of high means, but what you've seen works. And, and a couple of things that you talked here about kids that I just want to make sure folks hear is I love how in this, this, uh, you know, uh, making your kids work for it and have to go through the struggle. One of the things that you say to tell them is, you know, you want to give them all the support in the world emotionally, right? So you tell them, look, uh, hey, I'm going to give you the hard, hard truth here. Uh, you're on your own, junior, right? You're going to have to do this yourself, but you're not alone, right? We're here for you to support you emotionally, but also to be your, your font of wisdom, you can come tap us. Hey, you got a business idea. You want to bounce that off of us. 
um, we'll, you can benefit from all of our, you know, years of expertise here. We're rooting for you. We're here to, to, to cheer you on to win. How you actually execute the game plan is going to be up to you, though. So I think that's a really important element. Um, there are a few others, but, but I saw you smiling as I was saying that. So do you have anything else to add on that, that particular point? Well, I, I think what happens with people is that it, it doesn't mean you don't love your children at all, but if you really love them, you want them to be long after you're gone to be just, you know, standalone kind of people, you know, so uh, they don't have to have your money uh, to, to make that happen. And, and, and to me, uh, people, they, they forget, they lose sight of it. They, and they slip up and they, they, but it, you have to be really diligent on this. I wrote a little book we still have called uh, rich kids, broke kids. And the, and the byline was, the, the failure of, uh, of uh, estate planning. And the reason I wrote it is because they go in and people teach all of estate planning, we're gonna do this. Gonna, I, believe me, I do really believe in trust too, to take care of wealth. So don't get me wrong on that one. But the thing about it is they forget the biggest ingredient, which is to teach the, no matter how you do the estate plan, if you don't teach your second generation something, they can blow it anyway. And so uh, that's why we wrote that, but rich kids, broke kids, because it was so many, we've seen it so many times where they, uh, they didn't teach that part of it. The estate plan didn't make any difference. <laughs> you know, yeah. they, they didn't teach that part of it. So, you know, on this channel, I've railed a lot with, with our guests over the time um, of how poorly our education system teaches kids about financial literacy, right? And we end up generally sending people out in the world who really are wholly unprepared for the financial realities of the world. You know, they don't know how to budget. They don't know how to save. They don't know much about investing. Uh, they don't know how to, you know, take on a mortgage. Um, it's just sort of expected they're going to figure that out along the way. And many people stumble and make bad decisions and, and whatnot. Um, so I think there's a real dearth of, of uh, real education there in school that we need. Um, I think there's an equivalent in the home, which is what I'm sort of hearing from you here, which is that, hey, you know, we as parents need to be teaching our kids about how to be good stewards of, you know, and be good wealth creators, but also good stewards of the family wealth over time. Um, big part of it is going out in the world and figuring out, you know, the rules of wealth creation on your own, like we talked about. Um, but there are a few other things here you said that I think are also important. Um, uh, so they need to learn to make their own decisions, right? They got to exercise those muscles of doing analysis, coming up with a thesis, making the decision. They then have to learn how to be accountable for the results of their decisions, right? If they make a bad decision, you can't swoop in and make everything magically better for them. Um, and then they need to learn how to overcome adversity. Okay, so I had a failure. What can I do next to try to turn that failure into more of a success, right? And again, you just, you get that by practice in life. And the more you do, the better you get at it. And like you said, over time, they develop that self-confidence that, hey, I can take whatever life throws at me, right? That's all very key to becoming a good wealth creator. You also say, teach them about family wealth. Um, but I think I heard you say this earlier. Don't, don't just bring them in when they're early and say, oh, we have all this money. Just be a fly in the wall with our financial advisor. You really want to teach them what went into building that wealth, right? Like here are all the sacrifices we, need to make, we, we needed to make. Here are some of the big mistakes I made that were super hard to recover from, but thank goodness we did, right? They got to understand that that wealth just didn't magically appear in your pockets over time, that you had to, you know, a, a lot of hard sweat, blood and tears went into it. Um, answer any questions they have. So, you know, be a good educator for them. But this part I also thought was really uh, important. As you said, you know, your goal as the parent is for one day to pass the torch on to them to take over managing the family wealth. Um, but they need to earn their seat at that table. They need to go out into the world, provide that they can create and sustain and nurture capital well, and then eventually come back and kind of you know argue that okay I now need a, I now deserve a seat at the table here and you make them earn their way back in you just don't put them on the you know on the board and uh, and and let them start making decisions if they don't have a good basis for experience so I saw you nodding a lot as I was saying well I, you know what happens is you have to think about what you want to do I mean I have a son and a daughter okay when they were both twelve and thirteen we. I went to business owners and gave them cash for the whole summer. Now, they, now these children never knew this, okay? Uh, 
And so they would get they would get paid every Friday. Okay. But the business owner didn't have to, they were friends of mine. They didn't have to do anything. But the, what they did learn was this. If the first job, for example, my son was washing cars at a GM dealership, he was with people washing those cars that had no education whatsoever. So they got a good look at the, the world from the truly ground up. Okay. My daughter paid a, paid a person that had a women's shoe company. She had to work there all summers in the summers. I paid him cash. He paid her. She comes home, says, hey, you know what? Um, I saw these two ladies that I thought were really nice, but they were mean. <laughs> and I'm like, see, what's happening here? We're, we're, getting a, we're getting a piece of the world here, you know, where you, which you don't get if you're not out there. And so you press them, you push them into that. And then, and then they know after those years, okay, you got to get your own job. And then you get your own job. You know, it keeps on going. I, I, you probably think I'm pressing that part too much. But believe me, that is, an inf that is really the most important part to me of making sure your offspring understand where we're, this is going. They have to be able to stand on their own two feet. All right. So, um, so uh, make sure that your kids go out there and develop, you know, all those skills on their own. Right. Um, uh, and I should just underscore for folks here too, that Ted, you are a completely self-made man. You came from a, a background that was, I'll let you describe it, but, but you could say poor, correct? Yeah, I was probably more than poor. I mean, I, I, I was at the really, really, really low end of the socioeconomic scale. I mean, and I'm, I, and there's a lot of people like that. I, I, I'm not, there's so many really successful people that I see that grew up with nothing, but I, 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 you know, I had very little, no running water, no inside toilets. I mean, we, we lived in some shacks, but you know what? You get educated just, just like when people have money, if you, if you get out there and have to hit it, you learn pretty quickly. And uh, there's so many great people I know that build companies that, had a very similar background, and I'm always, always love to watch them how well they've done, and I, I've my hats off to them. Well, I, I wanted to underscore that for two reasons: one, so that folks don't think, oh, there's this ivory tower, silver spoon guy <laughs> who's telling me, you know, I got to go out and, and struggle. No, no, no. You, you, you've done it. You, you, you've, you've gone from the low end, you know, to to the successful end. Uh, and, and the other part is that, um, you know, you, you, you know, it can be done. Right. So for people who are who are looking at here and saying, look, maybe we don't have a lot of means, but I want my kids to be more successful than I, you know, well, Ted, you've you 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 came from, you know, poor means and and really knocked the ball out of the park. So you you know that there's a a pathway that folks can follow, and that's what you're trying to lay out for folks here. Well, you know, um, I have uh, founded two of the two of the primary foster child foundations in Texas. Uh, and we, between the two, they're 501c3s, but I really funded them big to, to keep the thing going over the many years, 22, 23 years. And we have about 10,000 kids a year. But if you want to really see a tough go, okay, you see a foster child that has to come out of foster care at 18 years old. And when that happens and they do really well now that is a success story much bigger than anything i've ever done or anybody else has done but i have so much um, respect for those kids that come out of there and then they push it forward and that's a it's a there's so many tough stories out there but there's a lot of people succeeding but i'm always optimistic that they you know if you can say hey, there's a lot of people can do it well, that's just absolutely inspirational. And I know you mentioned that for the reasons you you, you just gave, uh, but I do want to give you the kudos for what you're doing there to support those kids. And I think it's a really good example of the importance of why we're having this conversation, which is rather than having wealth that just gets you know spent away over a generation, how can you create it into something that leaves a legacy behind that supports great causes like that? And, and I, I want to end with... Uh, uh, one other element that you talk about. So we sort of talked about the hard stuff, right? You know, give your kids the tough love, make them struggle, et cetera. Uh, but then in terms of things that that you have seen in families that have done a good job in, in passing the wealth on for generations, these were some of the, the key success factors you found in common with them. Um, you write here that the key is keeping the family united 
both in terms of its family bonds, like everybody actually liking and enjoying each other, but also with sort of a shared mission. And there's this term familiness that you refer to. Can you just talk about that briefly? Well, what I've seen a lot of times is after uh, people have a significant liquidity event, the family has a lot of money, uh, and all of a sudden, and the, I think this is an era, by the way, but they start to treat uh, one child different from the others, and that that's never good in the long. That creates an unfamiliness, a matter of fact. And so, what you want is something where everybody's on equal footing. I understand kids are different. I understand that. Okay, that one is much e maybe easier than the other. But you know what? They didn't ask to be here. And so when you do that, I think the one thing you have to do to keep the family together <clears throat> is to be able to have, for them to be able to look at you and your spouse and what do you do? You know, are you running around, uh, you know, dilly dallying, throwing money away, doing that sort of thing? So you got to remember they're looking at you. And so if you say, you know what, I don't, I don't think I'm going to buy that because I can get it cheaper, I can do that better. You know, you, all those little things like that are go into that family thing. And, and they start to see the two parents. And you can't say as a parent, you know, I want you to be like me when you're, when you're just throwing money away and right. doing all so the crazy So you things. have to serve as the example of the type yeah. of person you want your child to become, obviously. And that's what creates the family situation. And I think as a person, the worst thing you can do as somebody with a lot of money to their children is to hold it over them. Because they'll never, they, they never pull out if you hold it over them. Yeah, you've got the money. And uh, you can say, I'm not going to, you know, you, you, you do things to them that they have a love-hate relationship with you. And that's not good. I've seen it many, many times. And they stay around because of the money. But deep down inside, they'd like to say, you know what, just give me some money and, and leave me be. Let me go do my thing. Right. Uh, and that, see, that gets away from the family thing. The family thing ought to be, hey, we're all pulling together. We're pulling for you, too. And um, we're going to teach you something. And you do that. And, and it's interesting because I always tell people, look, I said, there's so many things you can teach a, a young person about investing. I mean, if, if nothing else, have them go down, buy a rent house, go down the bank, borrow the money, have to do the lease. You know, have to take care of the insurance, figure out it does it cash flow. It's not on a big scale, but you learn a lot. <laughs> it's the same. It'll work in a big corporate building too. So that's how you teach. Uh, you know, you teach what's going on. Right. Well, they're certainly going to learn a lot more about the practicalities of uh, economics and finance doing that than going to most. You know, through most high schools and colleges. Sadly. Um, there were two other things that you mentioned that I thought were, were seemed to be great kind of best practices for families. Um, <clears throat> one was um, the sense of shared mission and sense of uh, shared values. So, you know, your job as the parent is to, you know, m determine what the family values are, but make sure that your kids are really aware of them. And of course, as you were saying, you have to live in accordance with them, right? You, you can't, you can't live, uh, set an example that's contrary to what you're trying to instill in your kids. Um, but it's a sense that, that they really understand the why behind what the family is, is setting out to achieve, right? We're not, we're not, we're not just making money so that we can all spend it. We're doing this yeah. because we have a shared vision of what this family, the impact we want it to have in the world. Well, and I'll give you an example of that. And I've, I've seen this with a, with a few people that, and it was really interesting to me the way they did it. They had, you know, they had plenty of money to have a private jet, but they didn't put, they didn't let their kids fly on it. Now people might say, well, how are they going to get to where you're going to your place in Idaho? And you know how they're going to get there? They're going to get on Delta or United and that's how they're going to get there. And they're going to figure out what, that, that's what you do and how, how you buy the ticket and that sort of thing. I got to go through TSA. You're not going to grow up from 15 years old getting on Bombardier every day and thinking that's the way life is because that's not the way life is, okay? So I've watched people do things like that and they separate what they're doing with their spouse from what, they're, what the kids see, you know? They do see you have a home somewhere, this, that, and the other, but they don't have to see everything else. And... I think that's what separates those people, and that's how they have the ability to really teach a lot of things because they they 
they don't they don't share every all that wealth all those trappings with them the only thing they get to see is you know okay i'm getting married here's your budget by the way hmm. it's not unlimited here it is <laughs> And they could afford it. I'm just saying they could afford it, but they do it the right way, which is, you know, you got to learn something. Exactly. And I just want to, I just want to reiterate that, look, you don't have to have $75 million to, to be setting this type of example. No, you can no. Be doing it, you know, much oh, more. I see, you're totally correct. I see people with $2 million that are spending it all on their kids. And I'm like, well, I know, you know, from people I know, I'm like, well, you know, you've got to retire someday. You could, but they do. And again, they do the child a disservice, but it doesn't, no, it's not a dollar thing. Uh, you're right. But um, it, it has to do with your attitude toward to what you're going to do toward children and how, how you're going to make it work. Um, and I have to tell you, there's a lot of great examples out there. And I see it with my interns. We usually have five or six interns a year. And uh, about two thirds of them are really, they really got it down. Or they, the whole, I can tell they've got it together, and a third of them don't have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, look, the the one last sort of success tactic here was, um, uh, and I've seen I've seen this with with families who I think have been successful at this is they prioritize uh, having family events that really are just designed around bonding with each other, building affection and creating a shared sense of legacy. Um, so they might be, you know, meeting at a place that's meaningful to the family or, or going back to where the parents used to go vacation when they didn't have a lot of money uh, uh, before the family became really wealthy, but it has a lot of sentimental value for them. And it sort of shows, hey, you know, even though we're very successful, we came from meager means. But it, but it's, 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 you know, getting the family together and not we're going to blow a bunch of money and pamper each other. It's we're going to invest in the things that really matter, which are just creating family memories and, 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 you know, strengthening these bonds that tighten us so that as you know, the torch gets passed on the, hopefully the values that made the original generation successful are really ingrained in, in the successors. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting because I've, I've written about this before, but there's certain sets of people that are really good about talking about the family and what this generation did, the generation before. I'll give you a good example of farmers. Why does a young farmer at 32 years old today, why are they pretty good at farming and just as good as their dad was, their granddad was, or maybe their great granddad? It's because they were taught and told that whole thing and they lived it, see, as they went along. And I think people need to do that. I mean, I think too many times you, once they really make it or whatever, they don't have a chance to sit down and really spend a lot of time with the kids and saying, this is, this is how you get to this point. This is why our family is so fortunate today to be where we are. Okay. And uh, that's only taught through conversation. You got to talk about it, you know, talk about things. And there's certain groups of people that really tell their stories. Um, and uh, you know, Jewish families do it really well. I mean, they, they tell the stories of what, how we got to where we were. And I think that's, um, that's interesting, but that's what you have to do in these family situations. And you're right about this. Just, you know, having, having some really simple things you do as a family, as a group, ends up being some really great memories. Yeah, well, it's funny. We'll conclude on this. Um, you know, if you go to YouTube and you just type in um, centarian advice, um, you'll find a bunch of clips of people who interview people that have lived to a hundred years or older. And they, they ask them, Hey, you know, what, tell the rest of us what really matters in life. And you know, none of them talk about the money that they amassed. Uh, none of them talk about things. They generally talk about relationships, uh, or they talked about, um, the things in their life that had purpose where they achieved a, a big goal that they placed a lot of meaning to. Um, and so to your point there, Ted, um, you know, it, it, it's not the material stuff. Uh, it really is you know, generally oftentimes just the more simpler things, but the things that truly matter. Well, look, Ted, thank you so much for imparting so much of this wisdom to us. I really was now, looking forward now. to have you on to, to dive deeply into this because it's not an area we get into very often. But I think at the end of the day, it's what people really care about, right? Where it's sort of like, look, in life, we all want to be rich, successful and famous or whatnot. But at the end of the day, we just want ourselves and certainly our kids 
to be happy, to be good people and to be happy. At the end of the day, when it comes to wealth, you know, yes, we want our wealth to be, um, we, we'd like to generate a lot of wealth and enjoy it. But really what we want to create is just a foundation that's going to serve us and our progeny well going forward in a sustainable, healthy way. And I think you've given us a lot of great uh, best practices, especially from your relatively advantaged position of working with the people who have been sort of the, the highest achievers and most successful on this thing. So I appreciate you selling, you sharing these sort of, you know, insider best practices with us. You bet. Thanks. All right. Well, look, um, as we begin to wrap things up here, Ted, for folks that have really enjoyed getting to know you through this, this conversation, where can they go to learn more about you and your work? Well, the, the website would be the best, Adam, which is oxboadvisors.com. And when you get there, it will, you know, there's many books you can order. We'll send them to you for no cost. And, and just look at, you, you will see what goes on. That website will carry you through the whole thing. All right, great. When we edit this, we'll, we'll put the link to your website up there on the screen. Um, again, Ted, thanks so much. Really look forward to having you back on the program. Everybody else, if you've enjoyed having Ted on, we'd like to see him come back on in the future and us have other guests of his high caliber on the show. Do us a favor and just support this channel by hitting the like button and then clicking on the subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. All right. Well, now's the time in the program where we bring in the lead partners from New Harbor Financial, one of the endorsed uh, advisory firms by Wealthion, uh, to react to what Ted said and to talk about what's going on in the markets. I'm joined, as usual, by lead partners John Lodra and Mike Preston. Hey, guys. How you doing? Hey, Adam. How you doing? Good to see you. Hello, Adam. Good to be with you again. All right, guys. Well, look, um, I was taking lots of notes as Ted was talking and thinking that you guys probably have an awful lot to uh, to share in, in this week's segment, um, not only in response to Ted's outlook for the markets, um, but also to the discussion about successful wealth building for families. Because like you guys, uh, Ted runs a financial advisory firm, uh, works with real people, um, helping them, you know, build real wealth uh, for, you know, real family uh, goals. Um, that Ted's clientele is a little more exclusively focused on the very high net worth individual. You guys deal with a wider range of people, um, but I'm, I'm assuming a lot of the same principles for success are similar there. So we can get into that if you guys want to, but why don't we start, John, we'll start with you. Um, uh, you know, Ted shared his outlook, uh, definitely seems to think Lower prices are still likely ahead. Bear market, not over. Talked about just not seeing any of that capitulation yet you see at the end of a bear market where people don't want anything to do with stocks. Uh, curious what you took away from the conversation. Yeah, Adam, thank you. Um, yeah, Ted's observations are, are very similar to to, to ours. Um, um, the uh, world is decelerating. He, he talked about that, and you can see it in the data. Uh, just today, the the uh, Fed Atlanta Now GDP forecast they dropped it uh, to uh, 1.4%, I think, uh, quarterly uh, GDP projected growth uh, one week ago. That was projected at 2.6, I believe. Uh, so we're seeing it in 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 our numbers here, but certainly uh, in in global uh, deceleration of of economies as well. And um, Ted right, rightly. Uh, observes as we've talked about with you and some of your other guests uh, so far, uh, Wall Street analysts have been very reluctant or or, or almost you know basically blind to uh, degrade or reduce any to any material degree their earnings estimates for companies uh, in the in the forward looking uh, uh, snapshot. Um, in fact, I think Ted threw out that the um, the uh, the consensus growth rate is for eight to ten percent year over year growth in earnings. That doesn't mesh with a you know a scenario of a of a global slowdown, and of course that uh, is combined with you know very high valuation multiples on on even these inflated earnings and and and, and earn, earnings margins. To the extent those earnings and margins decrease, those those inflated PE ratios or valuation metrics become all the much uh, more so extreme uh, as an outlier in, in a long expansive history. You can go back to the, even the late 1800s, which we'll, we'll flash a chart up later in the, in the program, I'm sure today to, to look at that. But uh, those are some high level takeaways. Love, love the, the dovetail into the real lives of his, his clients and the multi-generational multi clients that he and his firm with, Mike and myself and our team, Justin and our team, Christine and uh, Katie, uh, we deal with real real people that have real lives. It's not just their money, and and that really hit home for us. His his comments there because it is 
a very complicated and sometimes emotional equation when you bring into in, into the focus of family feelings, people, and emotions. It's 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 really a um, uh, an interesting yet complicated set of set of conditions. All right, Mike, I'm going to let you chime in here and piggyback on any of John's comments that you you, you want to there. Um, John, I do want to get to that chart that you referenced in just a minute here. But Mike, um, you know, happy to hear, love to hear what you you took away. Um, and also, I assume that like Ted, um, you guys are, um, you know, you remain positioned for um, a, a higher likelihood of lower prices ahead. Is that true? It's true. We believe, like like Ted said, that you know we haven't really had a classic bear market in twelve years. It's been easy street. It's been easy going. You really haven't had to do anything else other than business as usual. The business as usual is probably not going to work in the future from these heightened elevations and a market that still hasn't seen any fear or capitulation. As we speak, the VIX is in the low twenties. It looks like the S and P is eighteen percent off of its all time high. Um, and this is from an extreme bubble position. Uh, and in classic bear markets, you have a market that goes down for a long time. I think you know, Ted said something like he would expect another three or four quarters of, of, of a market decline. And then eventually you get some type of capitulation. But in the finale, you get a 25% flush at the end when you think it can't go any lower. And then finally, investors throw in the towel. We haven't seen anything like that. Actually, to the contrary. We've seen money being added to equities as the market declines. We've seen uh, equity allocations remain at extreme levels, 64, 65%. Uh, that's what people are actually doing. They're not getting out of this market. They're buying every dip. Every single thing that is said by the Fed causes a reaction. Uh, Fed speaker just came out a little while ago today and said, um, this is Brainerd, I believe, that said, we're going to do everything that we can to fight inflation. We're not going to stop. And the market rallied on that. Um, you know, so this, the market turns on a dime uh, with, with every everything that they say, and it's probably going to be a long road ahead. We think, like Ted thinks, that we're probably entering a classic bear market here, that defense is key, that the most important thing is to hold a lot of liquidity so that you have some dry powder to take advantage of uh, opportunities that come. Don't get sucked in too early. Have some kind of plan on how to, how, how to build your portfolio, either through dollar cost averaging or hedging into positions like we do. Uh, we, we, we think that it's different. We think the paradigm is changing. And it seems like very few actually believe that still. So we're very, very early on in this process. It's gonna be quite a ride. And uh, we, we have tools, we hope, to be able to navigate that properly and to be successful. All right. Yeah. Um, and it's funny watching the market bounce today after, well, Brainerd spoke. Um, I haven't seen the transcript of what she said. So she probably said something in there that that uh, gave uh, at least the algos something to respond to. But, you know, it does seem a little bit like almost what we saw through July and, and mid-August, where kind of no matter what the Fed said, the markets, they, they, they forced a positive interpretation of it. <laughs> they use that as the reason to go higher, even though what the Fed has been saying is, is hey, we're super serious that we're going to continue on the hiking program here. And, and, uh, and of course, you know, that's why Powell had to be so direct at Jackson Hole. And that's what started the, um, the recent resumption of downward pricing in the market today aside. Um, but uh, one thing that's one, one shoe that is dropping here that I think is is, is worth noting um, because it's it's something that could serve a trigger as a trigger to what Ted was talking about um, and what you just mentioned there, Mike, is the Fed's continuing to raise rates, um, which is going to be you know restrictive and contractionary. But we are now finally getting into the season where the Fed's full QT efforts are going to be underway. Um, where it's going to be shrinking its balance sheet to the tune of around $95 billion a month. Um, I had Kyle Bass on the program uh, two weeks ago, as you guys know, and Kyle really seemed to, to think that that is going to have much more impact on the economy than uh, the, the rate hikes to date have had. So that's where he really believes the rubber is going to start meeting the road. Um, and, and it's interesting, you know, I know you guys have a heavy cash position. You've recommended that people kind of be in cash in the near term. Ted, I think, feels similarly cash and, and short term treasuries. Um, 
just in the theoretical standpoint, there are two two factors going on that I think are, are worth talking about. And then maybe John, we can go to your slide. Um, one is we have the dollar milkshake theory going on, which is um, you know what Brent Johnson would, would the framework that he looks at the world through that I think we all agree with that that basically says as the world gets into trouble economically, mathematically more uh, there's a growing demand for U.S. dollars. Um, you know, part of that is because people are worried, and the dollar is the 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 cleanest shirt and the dirty hamper or whatever however you want to describe it but also the way that the euro dollar market is structured as uh euro dollar loans um begin to go into default um have to be repaid it 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 um it it, it accelerates the demand for for all dollars um and and what's interesting is you combine that with QT which I don't want to I don't want to say that this is you know super material in the way I'm about to describe it but it is it's real which is um, we are beginning to, the Fed is beginning to drain dollars from the system. And that in theory on the margin makes every dollar that remains in the system a little bit more valuable, right? Um, and uh, it's sort of reverse inflation, monetary inflation. Um, and so, you know, it just seems like, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of compelling reasons to be building cash here right now both for the anticipation of lower prices ahead but but even its purchasing power both internationally and domestically may be on the rise for the next quarter or two here while the fed continues to pursue qt so john let me hand it back to you feel free to react to that in any way but i know you have a chart that sort of gives a suggestion that we should be mean reverting anyways given inflation and a couple other metrics correct yeah, so I would like to comment quickly on on the dollar, Adam, and just more more broadly, uh, currencies. We're actually seeing some some real carnage in currency markets right now. Um, the uh, British pound, for example, has fallen relative to the dollar. I think to the lowest level since I, I believe 1984. The Japanese yen is absolutely imploding relative to the do dollar. Uh, and I got to be honest, I, that even struck me surprise by me by surprise on how quickly. That has fallen relative to the dollar over the last several weeks. Uh, it's really gone um, parabolic, in, you know, in, in its in its uh, degradation relative to the dollar. That can't be healthy for you know one of the largest economies on on the planet. Uh, and the euro is has broken parity. It's gone below uh, one one point zero on the dollar. These are these are pretty big moves, and and I think there's probably more implications uh, related to these than we can even imagine right now. These are big, big moves and sharp moves in a short period of time. Uh, so I just want to make that observation. But yeah, the, yeah the and, and sorry to interrupt, but just on that, on the Japanese yen alone, um, which has fallen the most, uh, it, it's fallen like 40% over the past year versus the dollar. You know, this is one of the biggest currencies in the world besides the dollar, and it's lost 40% of its value pretty much in the past 12 months. Yeah, and, and a, a good bit of that uh, erosion has happened just in the last handful of weeks. Uh, it's, it's been really, really sharp. Uh, actually, took me took me by surprise when I looked at the the daily chart on that. It's it's really pretty shocking. Um, but yeah, I wanted to reference the the chart that I showed you. And this is to give kudos to Ed Easterling, who was a guest on your program some time ago. We had the opportunity to to follow him up on on one of your your videos uh, several months ago. He's a, a great analyst, does great work with data. And this chart is a scatter plot that shows uh, uh, you know the relationship between the Crestmont PE ratio, which is a slightly adapted version of what might be called the cyclically adjusted PE or more commonly known as the Schiller PE. And that he he correlates that with uh, the inflation rate. And this chart goes back a long, long time. It goes back to 1871. Uh, I should should have add, added some annotations to this. The, the blue dots are periods when inflation is greater than three percent. The red dots to the left of the you know side of the chart are are when inflation is uh, less than zero. Um, the the bright green dots are when inflation is zero to three uh, percent. And then there's some dark like maroon dots. Those are the um, period that have that is basically 2014 to present so different epochs here of, of epochs of time here i guess are color coded but the thing that should jump out where we are today or or as of august of the, when this chart was updated is the yellow dot and and uh that's you can see it correlates with a pe ratio of about uh 35 and an inflation rate of just under nine percent um what should stand out to most folks on that chart is two things first of all we are an outlier 
on, on just on, on the PE ratio in general. Uh, very few times in history has the PE ratio been this high. But especially so if you look at where the PE ratio has been when inflation has been anywhere in the in, you know, area of where it is now. Uh, you can see that that yellow dot is uh, very much an outlier. Of course, there are some other dots in the neighborhood that, that are, are, are uh, reflective of recent dots. Um, but no matter how you look at this chart, we are in, in rare territory, both on PE ratio, but especially when you look at it uh, uh, from an, from a period of inflation as and this this ties into a comment that that Ted made in in the the video today uh, that uh, stocks during inflationary periods aren't a buy and hold proposition they tend to get severely whacked uh, because their earnings decline and their PE ratios get re rated downward to, to lower multiples in a, in a very profound way we haven't seen that happen yet but we think it's very likely going to happen. Uh, consistent with virtually all of history. Okay, yeah, and so you know what I find interesting about the chart is um, means data mean reverts, uh, and this this dot is showing us that we are um, you know at an extreme both in terms of valuation and in terms uh, of inflation. And um, yeah, the valuation part's pretty easy to understand. Okay, you know, price is likely going to have to come down for a whole bunch of reasons that Ted mentioned, and, and you just reinforced a couple of them, John. But also, the the CPI is likely to revert here. You know, is it going to go to zero? You know, probably not anytime soon. But I just want to underscore that a number of the experts we've had on this program, you know, I would say the consensus view is that we are going to see disinflation ahead from here, meaning we're going to see this CPI start coming down. Um, probably pretty gradually at first, but when you look at what the system is doing, is the system is trying to bring the CPI down, which is different from the past decade plus. Um, you know, we have the Fed definitely pumping the brakes here, definitely trying to take liquidity out of the system. Now, there's still maybe a couple of months more left of, of the liquidity that was unleashed over the past couple of years, you know, still pushing things around a bit, maybe some supply constraints. But I think in general, you know, we should be preparing for that eight plus CPI to start marching down um, because of all the actions that the Fed and the other central banks are taking here, just as well as sort of organic demand destruction as prices have gotten so high. And in theory, the system is also trying to repair uh, the supply chain breakages and therefore more supply should be coming online uh, as well during this period. Um, you know, is that exactly how things are going to play out? Who knows? But that seems to be the direction the wind is blowing in here. So we should... We should keep our eyes on that. Um, all right, Mike, I, I want to come back to you and i um, happy to still talk about anything in the markets, but I do think Ted gave us a rare opportunity to hear from you guys about maybe the softer side of wealth building. Um, you know, in talking with Ted, and actually it's a conversation that, that I've, I've now had with sort of several other um, sort of family offices and, and, and folks that, that deal with um, families and their money uh, that an equal amount of the success of um, you know creating wealth, but certainly uh, managing it, it and and sustaining it, meaning not just having it bleed away in a generation, um, is all interpersonal. It, it's really how the family, uh, you know, kind of either gets everybody on the same page, you know, shares a vision, shares values has a healthy relationship and healthy communications around money and their wealth, um, or they don't. And if they don't, odds tend to be very good, as Ted you know, emphasized for us, that um, you know, dysfunction creeps in and that uh, you know, the, money, the money gets wintered away relatively quickly. So um, love to hear anything that you guys have to build upon what Ted and I were talking about there, given your personal experience and experiences helping you know, hundreds of clients do this. Yeah, I'd be happy to comment on that, Adam. First, just a final thought on the topic we were just talking about a minute ago. I want to point out that that we agree with Ted that this time is not different, but that's what makes it difficult to be an investor today uh, or a money manager, because so much of what we believe and what we do depends upon the notion that it isn't different this time, that math does matter, that corporate profits are not going to stay at 12% forever, that they're going to more, they're going to mean revert back to where they've normally are six to eight percent and we've got a high high price to earnings ratio john talked about the schiller pe or the crestmont pe which is similar just a minute ago 
Now that's up in the 30s. If you look at that and adjust it for normalized margins, it would be more like 50, 45 to 50. So we have just a ridiculous stretch situation if you look at profit margins, if you look at valuations, and it's unlikely that they're going to be able to stay there forever. And Ted talks about holding a high amount of cash. I think that you wanted to jump in there with something. Well, well just, just real quick to underscore that I think for a lot of people, they have a lot of sort of average people have trouble wrapping their brains around the fact that things could fall further because in their minds, Mike, well, hasn't the market already corrected this year? Right, man, we're down double digits from the beginning of the year. You know, things kind of plateaued a little bit. Like, like isn't the sell-off over? And it's really important. That's where you want to go back to the data. And the data says, no, we're still at really historically high stretch levels of valuation here. That's the thing that makes it hard. That's what makes it hard to be an investor. If you, you you almost have to believe that it's different this time, that it will remain different, that we that math will not matter, and that we will never mean revert, that the Fed will always be able to rescue the market at every little dip. If you believe that, then it's it's probably proper to join uh, the index investors that just stay invested in the S and P five hundred index fund and just hope it works out over a long period of time. But we believe that based on math, not only are you not likely to make any money over a ten to twenty year period from these levels, you're likely to also experience a loss of greater than fifty percent. Ted talked about the period nineteen sixty six to nineteen eighty three where the Dow was started at 1,000 and ended at 1,000. We wouldn't be surprised to see a period here at the bottom of the next bear market where we write wipe out returns all the way back 20 years, you know, maybe even back to the previous breakout level um, of the 2008-2009 crisis. It's possible that low even gets breached, so we're certainly not calling for that. Anything's possible when you have a system and a set of conditions that is this extreme. The central banks have had no other plan other than to inject more money into the system, drive valuations higher and higher, and pray that GDP growth comes to bail it all out. Well, it's not happening. You know, so far they've been amazingly successful, but it's the hardest thing to do as a money manager and as an individual investor, year after year to say that this time is not different, that math does matter. I think that this time has probably been different for longer than ever before, but we're in what's almost certainly the largest bubble of our lives. And it, we, we should uh, see follow on to this, probably the largest bear market in our, of our lives. So a lot of these other things are just day-to-day -day fluctuations and it's a psychological mind game. It's a psychological war really on behalf of the central banks. And frankly, we think that's, um, that's, that's, that's just too bad. I, we, we think that's a, just a terrible thing that central banks have done to kind of use psychology to create this situation. So we'll see how it plays out, but we manage money with that in mind. It seems like Ted does too, uh, but it's really hard because sometimes you may have to wait years to be right. So um, I can also talk just a little bit about the softer side question. We, we've got a lot of clients. Um, we have hundreds and hundreds of clients. A lot of them are business owners. Many of them have sold businesses and had a large liquidity event like Ted talks about. First off, I can't think of a more difficult or, or dangerous time to get a big liquidity event than right now. We, we have a lot of clients in that situation and they may be near retirement age and they don't really have to necessarily work again if they don't want to. But what they really want to do is avoid the big mistake. You know, putting that money into the market and then writing it down 50, 60 or 70 percent or buying it all the way down with no hedging plan. I think that's a very high likelihood here for many people, because this is the perfect storm of what seems like a permanently high plateau and a lot of complacency and this just belief in buying the dips that just never seems to end. So we we help people to. Um, to, to keep their money safe. We often tell them, don't even invest it in the market. It doesn't even have to be a managed account. A lot of times we're telling people, just keep it safe. Just take a break. You've just sold a company. Give it a year. Give it two years. Right now, what you need to do, I think, is see what happens here. We think we're really late in the game of this market that's been trying to top since November, December, January. We're eight months into this topping process that's bear market that's only 18% from the high. There's very little fear, like I said, and there's going to be a lot of pain ahead, I fear, for, for people that are overcommitted. So we're happy to have those conversations, and it's beyond the scope of probably this video 
or this meeting to talk about all the things we talk about with those people. But the number one thing is just put it in liquid, safe money. Don't worry about hyperinflation eating away the value of the dollar right away because the dollar is probably going to be fine for a couple of years. The whole milkshake theory that you just talked about from Brent Johnson, we we think that's probably correct and it's, and it's actually playing out now um, to some extent. So just stay liquid, stay safe, be patient and have some kind of plan for getting in later. All right, uh, John, I'm sure you've got a lot to add to that too. So why don't we just hand to the torch? Yeah, I'll just I'll just add a couple of specific examples of the kind of the non-investment related software things that Mike and I and Justin and our team have have had conversations with even just this past week with clients. And it's pretty emblematic of the kinds of conversations we have throughout the year and over the years of a client's life lifespan with us. Um, you know, we talk about Social Security planning, for example, and oftentimes uh, pros and cons of, of timing decisions related to that. We talk about um, tax uh, aware strategies for maybe prematurely or, or electively taking distributions from retirement accounts uh, to uh, withdraw those funds uh, and still keep a client uh, within a, a favorable tax bracket so that they can get the money out, maybe put it in a Roth IRA or even just outside of a retirement account where it can be afforded more favorable capital gains tax treatment while they're in a lower tax bracket. Uh, we talk about estate planning type things, of course. Uh, we're not attorneys. We don't do estate planning documents, but we talk about um, uh, things like um, folks might have special needs children that, that need to kind of think about funding uh, their their. Um, financial security, whole range of things, business owners uh, wondering about the sales of their business, a uh, whole range of things that we invite clients to think of us as their financial quarterback or, or sounding board for, for anything that, that comes to mind, not just the nuts and bolts day-to-day -day of investing. Yeah, well, so one of the things I wanted to scratch here quickly before we move on. Um, so, you know, I, I, I talked about kind of the tenants that Ted had had written in his books about this is sort of the best practices that he's seen that kind of keeps families and family wealth together over time. Um, and also, I, I've got the perspective of being married to a, a marriage and family therapist. Um, and, uh, you know, look, a, a good financial advisor kind of has to be part therapist um, because you can come up with a plan for a family to execute on. But if the family is distracted by internal disagreements, you know, some of the natural dysfunction that many families have, um, it can get in the way of them actually executing well on the plan, right? Especially if you have uh, uh, key family members that, uh, you know, are in opposition, right? Um, and similarly, if you're, a, if you're a good therapist, you kind of have to be, you know, a bit financial advisor because money is one of the big three sources of, of friction and dysfunction in, in, in most relationships. Um, and to me, there's really sort of something in, in, in the overlap of the two um, because just sort of like we talk about with behavioral, the whole field of behavioral economics, right? It, it basically suggests that we as humans should make really intelligent decisions around money because it's so quantifiable that we can just do the math and make the sane empirical decision but we actually end up making really horrible decisions around money because we're we're basically primates and the way that our our brains are wired evolutionary they oftentimes influence influence us to make the wrong decision at the wrong time right um and so uh i see a big part of working with a financial advisor is a good financial advisor is somebody who kind of brings the coolness of thought and the ability to, you know, help the family kind of manage through, you know, it's, it's, it's lesser, you know, na nature that's trying to, you know, get in the way and muck things up. Um, you're trying to kind of, you know, smooth things over, help people dispass more dispassionately just sort of address, okay, what's the best thing for the family to do and let's do that. Um, and, and I'm just being transparent here. I've been spending a lot of time thinking about, how to kind of bring therapy into money more so that um, people and families can kind of get help from both sides of the spectrum. They can get the good financial guidance from a good financial advisor, and then they can have um, the advice of a, of a therapist in kind of helping them, let's say there are disagreements in the family or whatnot, helping them 
you know, be their their coach or their referee and helping them have those tougher discussions and get to a point of resolution and trying to get everybody on the same page so that the family can move forward and actually well execute on the plan that the financial advisor has, has put together. Um, and, and I can see you guys sort of nodding. I know you have to do this a lot in your your day to day jobs, guys. Um, but uh, but one, I, I guess, um, you know, do you see this as sort of a, a really good I almost want to say critical success factor, but the ability to um, marshal people, not just through the nuts and bolts of the numbers, but to try to help them, you know, really invest in the, the right kind of relational repair and, and relationship building elements to be able to work together as a better as a team going forward in, in terms of how we're going to take this wealth, manage it well, and hopefully build it over time and leave a legacy versus just spend it all and have nothing for the grandchildren. John, why don't we go to you? Because I can, I can see you nodding here. Yeah, Adam, absolutely. And and here's where we get to be the most human we can be because it's it's a, it's it's a really human discussion, right? We love the math, we love the numbers, we love markets, but uh, we like relating with people and we can be real with them, right? We we can put down the pretense of Wall Street jargon and we can just talk to them like they're members of our family. We have families. No family's perfect. There's always some degree of um, you know, friction, be it uh, friction that's uh, widely apparent or, or underneath the surface that folks don't even know is really causing them stress and, and duress. So, so we, we, we try our very best to, to just put our finance hats on the table when we have these kinds of conversations and really try to connect on a human level with with our clients and it may sound kind of corny but that's that's really what it takes it, it it takes being able to listen to them understand and and discern where their real fears are they may say something but we can tell that their fears are something other than what they're saying and we try to you know have a very human conversation with them about unpacking those fears and and getting to the the heart of, of really what's important to them and and what's we, we don't want to just mirror back what they say to us. We want to try to be an objective source of opinion and, and, and uh, advice, but we do need to be very empathetic with their, their situation in life. And, and I'm sure Mike can add plenty to this as well. Yeah. Just a couple of comments. You just, you, in that type of situation, you need, a, you need a good therapist and there's no easy way to tell how to find one or if you've got a good one, but uh, I can say that, throughout the years and decades now doing this job that that we've seen a lot of different situations and we've um, you know we've seen difficult situations ourselves that hasn't been easy to be contrarians for for a good part of the last decade during this everything bubble and doing so kind of forces you to look at your own emotions and understand the humanness of everything we're going through here and I think in turn helps us be more empathetic and connect with clients on these types of issues. And sure, we focus a lot on the money management and we understand all of the technicals related to that and all of the math that I talked about a minute ago. But a big part of it is the human factor, just connecting, listening, um, having the empathic connection and being able to be the unbiased third party a lot of times to get people to talk, to look at things at a different angle. And that's not to say we have the exact right answers all the time, but I think that our experience helps us understand the plight that a, a number of people find themselves in at different parts of their lives. And I think allows us to uniquely help them, help them get their arms around the situation and understand what might be the next best move. So um, I think that we do that very well and, and we're proud to, to offer that. All right, well, um, so something I've been sort of exploring on the side outside of wealthy on and I'll just mention it here because it sounds like you guys are are somewhat like-minded here is um uh, I'm gonna make a torture analogy analogy here but I'll try to make this quick folks um uh, when a car is built in America there are all sorts of efficiency standards that that car needs to meet in terms of like its miles per per gallon um, rating and everybody who's involved in the construction of that car is aware of how many miles per gallon that car needs to get Right. So the designer has to make the car aerodynamic enough to reduce the drag to be able to hit that that miles per gallon rating. Um, 
the folks that are building the car need to make sure that the materials are light enough. Uh, again, that it'll, it'll hit that rating. The folks that are working on the fuel system have that in mind too. So everybody works to make sure that the car coming off the factory lot is going to get X miles per gallon. Um, there's no equivalent when really when building a building in America, when most buildings get built. Um, yeah, there are there are a few that are like, you know, lead standard or zero energy that, that everyone's on the same page. But in most cases, nobody thinks about the home's energy efficiency and the architect is building just for the just designing it based on the aesthetics that he wants. The engineer is building it based upon, you know, the contractor is basing it built upon who's got the lowest bid, who he thinks can do it at a good enough quality level. Um, and it's really up to the homeowner to figure out how energy efficient this home is and that do they want to make any more investments as they if they want to get their heating bills down, right? But it's a very inefficient process. And, um, you know, people will have a financial advisor. Maybe they'll have a therapist. Those two generally, from my perspective, never talk to one another. And to me, there's a big opportunity there where if you had a therapist that really understood what the family's financial goals were, they could then work to find out what might be getting in the way of those goals successfully being achieved. And to the extent that there's repair that needs to be done in the family or just complicated family discussions or sensitive family discussions that are needed to get the plan well executed, they could be working in tandem with a financial analyst to make that happen for folks. Um, so I've just been spending a lot of time thinking about this um, because I think, as Ted said, and as I hear you guys saying here, getting the human element right is just as important as getting kind of the money element right in terms of long-term wealth management and wealth building. So curious, you guys don't have to agree that this is a good idea, but I'm curious what your, your very quick reaction to it is. John, do you have any opinion? Well, I, I think any kind of introspection that an individual or family can have, whether it's facilitated by a therapist or, or their own just um, honest conversations with themselves, can only be a good thing. Um, we, we coordinate with uh, clients, professional advisors all the time. Usually they're accountants, attorneys, things like that. Um, certainly if the opportunity presented itself, that if there was a healthy um therapist kind of conversation going on with with our clients and they wanted to pull us into you know I, I will say as 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 personal and as um uh sensitive the conversations we have with clients about their monies um I suspect that the the conversations they're having with therapists are even a notch higher so uh it would usually have to come from from that direction to invite us into those conversations and I think we'd be honored to to be an input to those conversations uh but Again, whether it's facilitated with a therapist or or one's own introspection about what's important, uh, we, we welcome that in, in any conversation we have with clients. All right, and sorry to interrupt, but but um, so it sounds like you think, hey, yeah, probably not a bad idea. I, I've talked, been talking to both therapists and financial advisors, uh, and it does seem that that communication between financial advisor and and therapist within a family really doesn't happen today. It, it, I don't think I've ever talked to one yet who said, oh yeah, we've actually talked to the family therapist. So it's just, I, I'm sort of zeroing in on this is that might be a really interesting, very value creating new relationship to develop. Uh, again, I'm just tossing it out there in the world. I, I, I don't wanna rat hole the conversation on that, but let me tell folks if you're listening and if this sounds like something that um, uh, you have a strong opinion on either way, uh, or have interest in, uh, just hit me up over Twitter. I'm just on at Menlo Bear. This is separate from Wealthy on for the time being. But um, it's uh, it's something that I just, my instincts are telling me there's something really there, there. And the conversation with Ted really kind of helped um, validate that for me. Um, all right, guys, as we wrap up here, Mike, I'll let you have the last word as we wrap things up here. Any, any parting bits of advice for folks, uh, either giving what's happening this week or what we just talked about here? I'd say don't give up on gold for those that, that are watching gold. Many are very, very frustrated miners. And even I think Ted mentioned this mining companies are ridiculously cheap right now. If you look at um, one of the major ETFs for gold mining stocks, GDX is trading about 10 points below where it was a few years ago when gold was at roughly the same level as it is today. Uh, and gold sitting here just above 1700 to us looks to be a great bargain uh, and it's just been it's been slow and disappointing so uh, don't give up on it would be my advice and buy some if you don't have some and um, really the only other thought I have is to just echo what you and John were just talking about is uh, these are difficult times you know talking about 
uh, integrating financial advice and therapy, I think makes some sense. Uh, have some patience. Don't get too emotional. It's easier said than done. But emotions and psychology are really the enemy here. And it's really, really tough not to get sucked into that. So try to have a plan. And if, if you don't know what to do for a plan, you know, just take your assets and put it in short term treasury bills. You can't go too wrong with that as you watch things unfold here in the next few quarters, the next year or two. So, uh, you know, hang tight, be patient. And uh, that's it. All right. Great. I appreciate you. You given the quick update on gold. I know a lot of folks have been wondering about that as gold has been trickling down. Um, one thing we didn't talk about, and we'll have to say for next time too, is um, yesterday, Bitcoin took another leg down. And um, as a result of that, the entire crypto universe, its market cap just cracked beneath $1 trillion uh, for the first time. I don't know how long, but you know, I think the crypto market cap was up approaching $3 trillion, you know, not all that long ago. You know, probably six plus months ago or so. So the fact that so much value has been lost um, in such a relatively quick period of time, um, that's a it's a big development that probably merits more exploration on our part, perhaps in next week's uh, next week's video. Um, all right. Well, thanks so much, guys. Uh, just in wrapping up, folks. Um, as a reminder, as we do every week, you know, it's a it's a rough time as. Mike and John have been explaining here. It's likely to go lower, as Ted uh, was was giving us uh, his reasons for. Uh, and so it's it, it really is a time for you to bring in professional help in terms of making sure that your wealth is safely navigating what's likely to come. Uh, we highly recommend that folks work with a qualified financial professional, um, ideally one that really understands the macro issues that Ted and I were talking about. And to be honest, there aren't that many out there that that truly do. Um, if you've got a good one who does understand those, fantastic. Stick with them. If you don't, though, highly recommend that you um, reach out and just schedule a free consultation with the wealth advisors that Wealthion endorse, endorses, um, perhaps even talking to John and Mike uh, specifically. Um, it's completely free. Uh, they, it takes you a couple seconds to set up. There's absolutely no commitment to work with them. They just have a, a conversation with you about your personal financial situation. They give you their advice. You can take it and do it yourself. You can do it with your existing advisor, or if you like these guys, you can talk to them further. Uh, to set up one of those free consultations, just go to Wealthion.com. Um, quick reminder for folks that the Wealthion Fall Conference is coming up really fast now. Uh, it's just uh, about two weeks away at this point, um, and we have a last chance to save price discount. Yes, the early bird discount of almost 30% has expired, but we have a last chance to save price discount of 15%. Uh, that's going to be around for about another week. So not for very long. So if you want to come to the conference, which is going to be amazing, um, go uh, first find out the details of the conference at wealthion.com slash conference. And you're going to be blown away and make sure you register um, and get that uh, discount while you can. Um, all right, um, John and Mike, uh, thanks so much, guys, for, for being with us. Folks, if you enjoyed having Ted on the program. Uh, love to see more continued great guests like him. Please support this channel by hitting the like button and then clicking on the subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. And whatever the markets do from here, I'll be tracking it next week with John and Mike together. Guys, thanks so much for joining me this week again. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching. Thank you, Adam. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. Thanks again, Adam. We'll talk to you next week. If you'd like to schedule a consultation with one of the financial advisors at New Harbor Financial, simply go to Wealthion.com. These consultations are completely free and there are no strings attached. The good folks at New Harbor will simply answer any questions you have about your investment goals or your portfolio and give you their best advice given their latest market outlook. They're willing to do this because they care about protecting people's wealth. And because Wealthion has connected them with so many thoughtful investors just like you over the past decade. We started doing this because so many people have approached us in frustration, looking for a solution because they're feeling out of alignment or downright ridiculed by the standard financial advisors who have been managing their money. You know the type. The kind that just pushes all of your money into the market, scoffs at the idea of owning gold, and when you bring up concerns about the market's sky-high valuations, they say, don't worry, the market will always take care of you. For many of the reasons discussed in today's video, we think this is one of the most challenging and treacherous times in history for investing. We strongly believe that today's investors are best served working in partnership 
with a conscientious professional financial advisor who understands the risks in play. Now, we're agnostic which professional advisor you work with, as long as they're good. If you're already working with one, that's fantastic. Stick with them. But if you don't, or are having trouble finding one you respect or trust, then consider talking to John and Mike and the team at New Harbor. Now, for those about to ask, yes, there's a business relationship between Wealthion and New Harbor, which we've put in place to make sure everything is handled according to SEC regulations. All the details on this are clearly provided on the Wealthion.com website. Also, it's important to note that New Harbor is able to work with U.S. citizens, green card holders, and those with existing assets in the USA. But for regulatory reasons, they aren't able to take on non-U.S. clients. All right, with all that said, if you'd like some insight and guidance on how to protect your wealth during this unprecedented time in the markets, go to Wealthion.com to schedule your free consultation with the good folks at New Harbor. Thanks for watching. 